Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be playing Atlantic Fleet. Uh, this is part three of a Let's Play series, which I started uh, looking at Atlantic Fleet. And uh, in this video, I'm going to be talking about the historical battle of the River Plate. I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, it might be plot. But basically it's an engagement that took place off the coast of South America, near Uruguay. Uh, where the German pocket battleship Graf Spee was engaged by three British cruisers, two heavy cruisers, the Ajax and the Achilles, uh, two light cruisers, that is, and then the heavy cruiser Exeter. Uh, the German pocket battleship was engaged. Uh, it was not exactly defeated, per se, but it, it suffered damage that ensured it wouldn't be able to escape for long, and uh, it fled into the, into the port of Montevideo, uh, where the Uruguay government allowed it to stay for the required 72 hours uh, under the laws of neutrality, after which point it was required to leave, and the crew and the captain decided to scuttle the ship uh, because they believed where they were heavily outmatched and had no chance of winning a battle. Furthermore, it had, had suffered damage which ensured it would not be able to escape. But, uh, before we talk about that battle, and the reason I'm talking about that battle right now, uh, this is the third part of my Let's Play series, which I'm really going to get into kind of a naval history look at World War II in the Atlantic. So I'm going to kind of go from the start of the war uh, through the war and talk about the different major uh, events and battles and sort of technological developments that occurred. Uh, throughout uh, this series, but I'm jumping ahead to the uh, Battle of the River Plate uh, as this sort of introductory episode into the history of World War II at sea. And again, that's going to be at the Atlantic Theater, mainly because this battle that we're watching right here and we'll be watching for probably the next 13 or 14 minutes very closely resembles the Battle of River Plate. And I thought if I've got this great gameplay footage uh, that very accurately mirrors uh, to some degree anyway, uh, what happened in this battle, why not talk about it? Um, with that being said, to understand this battle, uh, I think you really have to go back to World War I, oddly enough. Um, the reason for that is in the opening days of World War I, much like uh, the Graf Spee, which we've talked about was a pocket battleship, uh, it was a battleship that had six 11-inch guns, the ship itself was only 10,000 tons. Battleships tended to be around 25 to 30,000 tons and, and even heavier uh, during the World War II period. So, as you can see there, we just suffered a pretty big hit. Uh, so it's important to understand that the pocket battleships weren't really battleships. They weren't even really battle cruisers. You know, the idea of a battleship is a heavily armored but somewhat slow warship with incredibly heavy guns, incredibly thick armor, and no other ship in the world can beat it unless it's another battleship. The idea of the battle cruiser is something in between. It's not really a heavy cruiser. It's not a, you know, a very fast... Well, actually it is, but it's not a sort of moderately armored cruiser, you know, 8-inch guns with a heavier but light armor belt that has no ability to stand up to a battleship but is very quick and can outrun a battleship, a battle cruiser is kind of in between. It's a heavily armored ship, generally somewhere between 11 to 15 inch guns, just like a battleship, but it's also very fast and it sacrifices its armor, so it's not nearly as well armored as a battleship, to gain the advantage of speed. And the pocket battleships were a little bit less. They were actually designed with the Washington Naval Treaties in mind, uh, the treaties that uh, occurred after World War I, which put serious limitations on the size of ships. Germany wasn't allowed to have any battleships anyway, so these were sort of heavy cruiser quasi-battleships. They had battleship-like armor, 11-inch guns were larger than any of the large cruisers, but the armor belt was very comparable to a heavy cruiser. It was between 2 and 4 inches on the warship, whereas a battle cruiser typically had along the armor belt, still had 8, 9, 10, 11 inches of armor. The reason I mention that is to really understand the Battle of the River Plate, uh, you have to look back to World War I, to the opening days of World War I. Uh, just like in World War II, the Graf Spee, uh, which had been sent to sea before the war uh, and was in place to commence commerce raiding against the British, uh, at the start of World War II, a German battlecruiser was in the Mediterranean Sea. The battlecruiser was called the Breslau. 
Uh, you could say it was comparable to the Grash Bay in sort of it being a very fast, very heavily armored ship uh, with light armor but very heavy armor armaments. And the Guben, uh, which was this German battle cruiser in the Mediterranean, uh, was kind of caught like the Graf Spee when war broke out in World War I. It had sort of dubious orders. It was, you know, one of the objectives was to intercept and interfere with uh, French troop convoys that were going from Africa to uh, southern France, bringing troops to the front. Uh, but then it also had some some designs on maybe breaking out of Gibraltar and getting into the Atlantic, and you know commencing commerce raiding in the in the Atlantic Ocean against the Allied powers as well. But the Gubin ended up uh, deciding to flee to Turkey. It had no real safe ports in the Mediterranean. It could have fled to Austria-Hungary, but it would have been bottled up there and uh, played no substantial part in the role in the war. So the thought was we can send it to Turkey and maybe that'll help, uh, you know, one, it'll allow us to escape and who knows, maybe it'll allow us to influence Turkey's uh, status in the war and uh, end up, uh, you know, helping bring them into the war on the side of the Germans. I don't need to go into too much detail of the chase of the Gurban, which basically went from sort of the we central western Mediterranean around Sicily and Messina and, you know, the, the Italian boot, uh, all the way through the Aegean Sea and into the Bosphorus Strait before arriving at Constantinople. But the one thing I do want to talk about is you see here my ship starting to get really pounded and dropping in the water and starting to list heavily. Um, Needless to say, the Lutzo is going to suffer a similar fate to the Graf Spee, except she looks like she's going to be beaten in battle. Interestingly enough, uh, the British heavy cruiser here that's fighting against us is suffering very heavily, just like the Exeter did in the real battle, while the light cruisers are largely okay. Again, this battle very closely mirrors the Battle of River Plate, of, although the battle will probably be over before I discuss the battle. But going back to the Gubin, um, the Gubin was fleeing from British and French naval forces in the Mediterranean trying to get to Turkey, trying to get to a safe port at the start of World War I. And the reason I mention that in reference to the Graf Spee is the Gurban, as it was fleeing, uh, a British task force of four heavy cruisers, they were called armored cruisers at the time, uh, had a chance to intercept it. They were in front, they were on course, the commander had intended to intercept it. So this British task force of four armored cruisers, one of them the Black Knight, uh, intercepted, or was it the Black Prince? I think it was the Black Prince, was on course to intercept the uh, Gubin, and they knew it. Uh, the commander of this flotilla, it was four heavy cruisers and eight destroyers, uh, was a admiral named Admiral Ernest Trowbridge. And he believed that if they intercepted the Gubin, they only had any chance of uh, winning a fight against the Gubin if it occurred at night. So the thought was, we can we can beat uh, the Gubin if we catch them at night. And the rationale was this. The Gubin had, just like the Graf Spee, 11-inch main guns. The four British heavy cruisers had 9.2 or 9.4-inch main guns. They had something like 20 or 30 of them on their ships, maybe even more. Uh, and the Gubin had 10 11-inch guns. So they heavily outgunned in terms of actual tonnage and actual numbers of um, turrets and guns. But they also outnumbered in terms of platforms. The Germans had a light cruiser, and then they had the battle cruiser Gubin. So on the, on the face of it, if you could bring four heavy cruisers with pretty heavy armament up against a battle cruiser, you could, in theory, you could overwhelm it. But Ernest Trauber decided to uh, pull back. He didn't want to. Um, he didn't want to engage the Germans uh, because basically his flag captain came to him and said, "Listen, these German, this German battle cruiser, not only is it does it have larger guns, so it outranges us, but it's also faster than us. It can basically determine if we're able to even get in range." What they were afraid of was that this German battle cruiser, if engaged, would merely stand off within the range of its 11-inch guns, but out of the range of the British guns. Uh, if the British couldn't close to within 16,000 yards, the thought was they would have no chance of doing any damage to the Gubin. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, could accurately fire anywhere between 16 to 20,000 yards out. So if you can't close to within 16,000 yards 
and the enemy can shoot you from 16,000 to 20,000, then you're basically just fish in a barrel. They just destroy you at will. Uh, and the reason that they could do this is, again, because of the fact that uh, the Germans had superior speed. So, if you tried to close, they'd just speed up, turn away, and then you'd never catch up. Meanwhile, they'd keep pounding you and pounding you and pounding you. So Ernest Trauber decided to, and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunci pronunciation of his name, decided to turn away. His four heavy cruisers would not engage the Gerben. This led to a firestorm in Britain. It led to a, a, a very divisive court-martial in which many figures in, in the Navy both sided with and against uh, the British Admiral. Some claiming, no one claimed he was a coward, uh, but some claimed... Uh, that he acted inappropriately, and that by letting the German battlecruiser get away, he did irreparable harm to the uh, to the British Navy, and actually uh, directly ended up leading to uh, the entry of the Ottoman Empire uh, into the First World War. So the argument essentially was that four British heavy cruisers should be enough to take on one German battlecruiser and a light cruiser. That argument was kind of dealt a blow during the Battle of the Falklands, during later in World War I in 1915, when the German East, in Africa, East Asia Squadron, uh, as you can see that the Lutzo was sunk, we did very heavy damage to the Suffolk, which again, this battle really mirrors uh, the historic Battle of the River Plate because the Exeter was heavily damaged, uh, but the other two cruisers weren't. The only difference is uh, I was sunk at sea. But as I was saying, the, the main difference at the Battle of the Falklands, uh, the German East Asia Squadron under uh, von Spee ended up engaging two British battle cruisers as well as some other auxiliary ships. And the two British battle cruisers uh, did exactly what Trauber was afraid the German battle cruiser would do at the beginning of World War I, the Goeben. He was afraid that the, they would stand off out of range from him and pound him at their leisure. And the same exact thing happened to the Scharnhorst and the Genesu in the Battle of the Falklands during World War I. Uh, the British battle cruisers sped to within range. The Germans turned and tried to flee, but they were unable to escape. When it turned out that the British battle cruisers were too fast for the Germans to run away from, they turned in and tried to engage them closely to get in range of their 8-inch guns. But the problem is the British battle cruisers had a substantial speed advantage. So every time the Germans would try and close, the battle cruisers would simply turn away a little bit, stay inside the range of their main guns, and pound the cruisers into, into submission. And thus, very easily, these uh, British battle cruisers were able to destroy two German armored cruisers. Now, this battle was a little bit different because there were two battle cruisers versus two armored cruisers. So the odds were certainly very different. Uh, but nonetheless, the British were able to destroy at leisure these German heavy cruisers and some other auxiliary cruisers as well. So this would seemingly be something that looks like it would support uh, Trauber's decision to avoid a, a head-on engagement uh, with the Goeben. Fast forward to World War II, the Battle of the River Plate. So in this battle, uh, the German battle uh, not battle cruiser, pocket battleship uh, von Spee had been uh, the Graf von Spee um, had been, and actually <laughs> interesting that this sort of a fight between a what would amounts to a almost a battle cruiser and three other ships uh, closely mirrors uh, a a Falkland like situation. Uh, in that you've got, you know, cruisers versus battle cruisers, uh, just like what happened to uh, um, the Gr Admiral uh, Graf von Spee in, uh, in World War One, He was killed at the Battle of the Falklands. Well, now the ship uh, that was named after him uh, was engaged in, in a fight in the South Atlantic uh, with a battle cruiser versus three cruisers. So, again, interesting. But anyway, as I was saying, so the Battle of the River Plate, the German pocket battleship was at sea when World War I broke out. Uh, it ended up sinking something like seven or eight merchant ships during the opening, opening days of the war, and the British put together a task force to hunt it down. And unfortunately for the Germans, the Graf von Spee's uh, reconnaissance aircraft broke down. So it removed its aerial reconnaissance. Now this had been helping it pick out and locate merchant ships and allowing it to help run down merchant ships. 
but without its visual eyes, it ended up spotting three masts on the horizon, which it thought were escorts for a heavy British convoy, which it had intended to attack, so it turned in to engage. Little did it know it was no convoy, it was actually three British cruisers. Two Ledender class cruisers, the Ajax and the Achilles, actually you saw me fighting them uh, just a few minutes ago uh, when my when my battleship, the Lutso, was sunk. Uh, and then the heavy cruiser Ajax, or the heavy cruiser Exeter. The Germans decided to engage, and at long range they began pounding the cruisers. Now this was different than the Gerben incident during World War I. And that's because the Graf von Spee was not faster than the British cruisers. The Exeter, the Ajax, and the Achilles could all make over 30 knots, while the Graf von Spee was actually only capable of making 28 and a half knots. Uh, also factor in the fact that the ship had been at sea for many months, and the ship was even less capable in terms of its top speed. So right there, uh, it's not a similar situation to the Gubin. Basically, you don't have the advantage of speed, so you can't keep the enemy at range and just pound them into submission. You're Basically, if they want to engage you more closely, they can. And that's what the British started to do. So the Germans were trying to stand off and trying to you know, fire at the British at long range, but the British were able to close to effective range for their 8-inch guns. At which point they began pounding the German pocket battleship Graf Spee. In fact, over 70 hits were registered against the Graf Spee. Now, most of these hits were inconsequential. Uh, the ship was not very well armored, however, so this is going to be another difference between the Goeben incident and the Graf von Spee. Uh, the Goeben had a main belt that went up to 11 inches of armor, so while it was a battle cruiser, while it was more lightly armored uh, than the dreadnoughts of, uh, of you know, the main fleets, it was still very heavily armored. When you actually look at the pocket battleships, uh, including the uh, Graf von Spee, it only had up to a 4-inch main belt, and again, that was to save weight. These ships were designed to only weigh 10,000 tons. That's less than a third of the weight of most battle cruisers or battle ships. So it's not an issue where you're sacrificing weight for speed. It's an issue where you're sacrificing weight for speed and the ability to even have the ship exist with these heavy guns on it. Uh, so again, only 4-inch main armor. That meant that these 70 hits from medium caliber guns, 8-inch guns and 6-inch guns, were going to be much more effective when they're only dealing with 4 inches of armor than if they were dealing with 11 inches of armor. So again, another example there where this is not a similar scenario. And then despite this, despite the lack of a speed advantage and despite the lack of heavily armored uh, belt, the Graf Spee crippled the Exeter. It knocked out its two forward turrets. Actually, I think it knocked out three of its four turrets. And it knocked out its electrical systems. So the Exeter was basically a listing and kind of drifting hulk that the Graf Spee could have finished with leisure. Uh, however, it uh, mis mistook the damage and didn't realize the damage was as bad as it was. Further, the other two British cruisers were harassing it, but then it turned its guns on the other British cruisers and again began hitting them. I want to think I think it was Achilles who was hit by at least two 11-inch shells, so it was pounding Achilles as well, uh, but uh, a lucky shot from the Exeter uh, penetrated the uh, Graf Spee's limited armor, and detonate it in a fuel mixing area of the ship. So basically, the ship has all this fuel, but it's stored in these kind of different compounds. Basically, you've got to you've got to kind of mix the fuel. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but it's almost like when you have like a you know a gas-powered item that you have to have an oil-fuel mixture, but you don't necessarily store the two together. So they had to mix this this fuel to make it you know able to be burned by the ship. And a shell goes in there and destroys this complicated and very important piece of machinery on the Graf Spee. So at that point, when that shell detonates, the Graf Spee knows that it has lost its fight. It has badly battered a British heavy cruiser into submission. It had started doing bad damage to a British light cruiser as well. It probably could have, uh, all things being equal, and the ship not, uh, you know, getting an unlucky hit in an unlucky spot. It may have been able to sink the Exeter and maybe, you know, badly damaged another cruiser. Certainly enough so that it could have escaped. Uh, maybe one of the cruisers remains as a as sort of a shadow. It's hard to say, uh, but it certainly could have. Uh, survived. But the problem is when that fuel mixture uh, machinery is destroyed, it meant that the ship only had 16 hours of fuel left. It would have 16 hours of fuel that could sail around and burn, 
but it wouldn't be able to repair that machinery. It needed a port that had capabilities beyond what the ship could do internally. So basically one of the most important parts of the ship is destroyed by a lucky shot that doomed the ship. And that's again why the ship then turned tail, ran, and tried to uh, put in at Montevideo, wasn't able to repair the damage adequately enough, and as a result it decides, you know what, rather than surrender, we're going to go ahead and we're going to scuttle the ship. So they leave most of the crew in port at Montevideo to be taken into the custody of the Uruguayan government, because again, uh, Uruguay is neutral, and then a small crew sails it out into the uh, river plate and decides to scuttle the ship. That basically means you blow your ship up, and then you, you know, kind of get off the ship and, and just give up. That way you don't, it doesn't fall into the British hands. So, Graf Bay is defeated. And the reason I keep coming back to Gerben is because, I, I can't remember the name, but I'm reading Castles of Steel, or I'm listening to it on my way to work every day. And a famous British uh, figure, I don't know if it was Churchill or not, but someone in the Admiralty, I think it was, maybe it was the First Lord of the Admiralty, sent in a message to the commander of these British cruisers uh, that even if he had lost all of his ships, he had made the right decision uh, to engage uh, the Germans. And, and even if everything was sunk, it was the correct decision. It was the correct, bold decision. Uh, he then said that he proved the court-martial of Admiral Trauber incorrect by his actions, essentially arguing that because you proved that your three cruisers could take on the Graf Spee, what you really proved was that Admiral Trauberg was at wrong, and he should have engaged with his cruisers during World War I against the Gerben. And if he had done so, he would have been victorious. I take issue with that for a few reasons. I've already mentioned the Graf Spee didn't have a speed advantage. It didn't have the capability to sit off at 16 or 20,000 yards and bombard the British. It, it didn't have that ability. It also didn't have the armor that the Gerben had. The Gerben had 11-inch armor. The Graf Spee had 4-inch armor. That made that lucky shot all the more likely because there wasn't an adequate armor belt around the ship uh, because it was just too small and too light. And when you factor in those, those considerations, you also realize that the Graf Spee only had 6 main 11-inch guns and you consider the Gerben had 10, all of a sudden you're talking the Graf Spee versus three cruisers. Granted, only one of them was a heavy cruiser, but Graf Spee versus three cruisers more or less tactically won the engagement. The Exeter was horribly damaged. It would take over a year to repair when they finally got it back into port. The two light cruisers suffered some damage, nothing too severe. Uh, but the Graf Spee was actually in pretty darn good shape if you exclude the fact that it couldn't mix its own fuel anymore. So that's where I really take issue with that statement, is that it doesn't in any way prove the Gerben could have been taken, because what really proved the Gerben probably would have been fine is the Battle of the Falkland Islands. The Graf Bay didn't have the ability to turn back and say, nope, you're not getting any closer, we're just going to keep pounding you at this range. The uh, Gerben did. Uh, the Graf Bay didn't have the ability to take 8-inch shell fire and have it not penetrate its armor, because it only had 4-inch armor. And again, the British heavy cruisers in the Mediterranean during World War I were armed with 9.2-inch guns. The Gerben could withstand that armor, especially at long range, uh, where the you know some of the energy of the shell would be spent. So again, another example of where that just that doesn't apply. It's not an applicable scenario. So I think it's interesting um, to to look at these because they're they're similar scenarios where a heavy warship is at sea at the outbreak of war, and it's commenced with a numerically superior but perhaps uh, quality inferior uh, opponent, and then kind of see how the two situations mirror themselves and yet they're different. Um, anyway, that was just kind of my random ramblings uh, on the Battle of the River Plate, which I didn't get into too much detail, but just sort of more talked about uh, the example of the Gerben during World War World War I, uh, which I found fascinating, again, because right now I am reading... Uh, or listening to uh, Castles of Steel, uh, which is a book written by Robert Massey, which details the First World War at sea. But anyway, um, I guess that's enough of my rambling for this episode. Uh, in the last uh, battle, you saw the Lutzo, a uh, pocket battleship of the same ilk as the uh, Graf Spee. You saw the Lutzo uh, end up being uh, destroyed while engaging three British cruisers, a heavy cruiser and two light cruisers, 
Uh, so it was easily destroyed by the British fleet there. Uh, in this particular battle, you can see we've consolidated the Scharnhorst and the, uh, I can't speak, the Scharnhorst, the Genisu, and another pocket battleship, as well as one destroyer into a flotilla uh, of uh, immeasurable strength uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, and now we're conducting commerce raiding. I wonder, it'd be kind of interesting to me, what would have happened if the Germans had organized their commerce raiders into wolf packs rather than individual ships. I'm sure the British would have, you know, brought overwhelming force to bear as they could have. Uh, but imagine if the three pocket battleships were all at sea operating in tandem at the start of the war. Instead of having one pocket battleship, you've got three. You know, now to effectively deal with them, you have no choice but to deploy probably multiple battleships. And then you've got large, you know, task forces sailing around the ocean. Uh, I would imagine being able to very effectively disrupt commerce and traffic. Uh, you could kind of spread the battle, the ships out so that uh, you could cover a wide swath, you know, maybe 40, 40 miles, 20 in each direction that you'd have visibility over. So you could, you know, scour the oceans for merchant ships and then consolidate into one group uh, if you ended up running into any trouble. Um, I think that would be a really interesting idea. You know, the, the Scharnhorst and the Genisu, I believe, operated in tandem. Uh, they fought the Renown, I think it was, at uh, in Norway, and they sunk the carrier Glorious. But imagine if, and the Hipper may have been a bad example, because that ship constantly had engine troubles. But imagine if you had the Scharnhorst, the Genisu, and three pocket battleships all organized together into a large task force into the open oceans, you know, you could cover over 100 square miles of territory at any given time, uh, could really disrupt commerce traffic into Britain, uh, and in addition to that, require the British to deploy probably three or four heavy battleships in a single uh, weapon. I mean, they wouldn't have the ability to deploy four or five task forces against you. They'd have to really bring, you know, a third of their fleet. They might have been able to form three fleets like that. Um, it's just an interesting idea because especially during the early World War II period, the British battleships were very slow when compared to the German, what really amounted to battle cruisers. Uh, the Scharnhorst and the Genisu uh, were both much faster, uh, and so were the pocket battleships than the uh, British battleships. It wasn't until you really started to start seeing the King George V class battleships come online uh, later in the war that you started to see fast British battleships uh, become more commonplace. But I suppose that's a discussion for another time. Uh, I think what I'm going to do with this video here is I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kind of end the video. Um, we talked about the Battle of the River Plate. We really talked more about the uh, German battle cruiser Goeben and the chase to try and get the Goeben and then the failure and kind of the rationale behind that. Uh, and then we also witnessed two sea battles here uh, in this video. Uh, spoiler alert, we're going to sink the, the, the remaining merchant ships uh, and, and win the battle entirely by wiping out this convoy. Um, so, so far in this game, uh, we dealt with one big defeat, and that was losing the pocket battleship, but we've done a pretty decent job where we've met the British merchants of, uh, of wiping out large numbers of them. We just aren't running into their convoys frequently enough. It doesn't seem like we're destroying, if we're looking at raw tonnage totals, it doesn't seem like we're destroying ships quickly enough, uh, which, uh, you know, makes things difficult if we're trying to starve Britain. I don't know if we need to have the, you know, half a million or more tons of ships sunk a month. Uh, to mirror reality or not, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it seems like the German fleet exactly mirrors the historical German fleet. L fewer submarines that it starts with and fewer uh, destroyers, but the heavy capital ships all uh, exactly match up to their real-life ratios, so I wonder what the actual ratios are needed of destroyed merchant ships. But that's enough of me talking at this point. I'm really just kind of rambling, and uh, we've sunk all but one of the, the merchants, and we're about to finish off the other one. Um... So, anyway, guys, I, uh, I appreciate you tuning into this video. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Let me know what you think in the uh, comment section. Uh, like this if you liked it. If you disliked it, feel free to dislike it. But if you do that, I just have one request. Tell me what you don't like. Um, you know, I've had people kind of say, oh, it's boring. Well, you know, I, I recognize this video isn't going to be for everyone. But if you have any constructive criticism, I'd be happy to hear it. I'm always looking to improve my videos and make them better. And, you know, while, I, while there will always be some people who don't enjoy it, uh, I just appreciate knowing what don't you like or what do you like um again I, ha I have pretty much overwhelmingly positive uh comments but i'd like to hear anything that you guys have to say that you think you know maybe i could do something different 
Anyway, guys, uh, that's, again, enough of me going around in circles saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.